Well, well, well. Look who it is. It's me, and it's you, audience. This week, Grim Dark James brought back an old classic, a favorite Warhammer fantasy, in order to socially pressure Big Spoon into restarting the campaign. And in the process, he did character creation for Lawson. And during that character creation, Lawson claimed he was the co host of this show. And that claim is not true. You see, in order to be the co host of the show, you would have to present topics. Now, Lawson was given an option. He was given no. First off, Blood Bowl's not for my channel. I don't. I don't consider Blood Bowl. Get out of here. Get out. Um. I believe Lawson was given an option to present the VTuber beef that he had, and he chose not to. So he has chosen not to be a co-host. But I'll tell you who is a co-host. Chris Oss. Yes, Chris has presented numerous topics, and James, I don't know that James presents topics as much as asks thought-provoking questions, but I would say, if I was to name a co-host, which I'm not, and the, it's not up for discussion, it would be Chris. Chris is the closest we have to a co-host for this show. Lawson, if you want to try to claim that title, you gotta step up. That's all there is to it. I do my job. I'm just here to be here. Wow. What a incredible. You got anything to introduce for the intro hour? Not this time. Okay. James, you got anything to introduce to the intro hour? No, no, I'm I'm waiting to be I guess my topic's waiting to be introduced. Do you want do we, should we just skip to the survey data then? Oh, I mean, I'll, I'll, it's your show, AP. I'm not a co-host, clearly. That's Chris's job, so <laughs> I'll... Uh... <laughs> All right, Chips, you said that you don't want to skip to the survey data, so I'm going to keep going down the list as I've written it. I, last week, got into, let's say, I don't want to say trouble, but there was some cooking involved in regards to talking about how to describe characters, specifically how to describe women. And I kind of, I don't, I don't want to say I got shit on, but I feel like I caught some flack in there. And I want to elucidate why in, in what the French term as the wit of the staircase, which is often I forget to say things in the middle of saying them, or I show up later and I'm like, you know, I actually meant this. It literally happened today where I, I was having a conversation with James and I was like, Yes, these women have gotten married, and he was like, and had kids, and I was like, yeah, it had kids. That's what I meant to say, was that they got married and had kids, and that... So anyway, the point of talking about describing characters, and specifically the care with which I take to describe women, is because I am a subscriber on YouTube to several channels which are... Um, how should I say this? They're mocking of men writing women and also women writing men. Specifically, I think probably the one to highlight here is an author by the name of Liz Shipton, who does both shorts and longer form videos that specifically mock a number of novels that I have read. Pretty much anything written by Sarah J. Moss has been on, on fucking blast from her. Divergent, Twilight. Hunger Games, all of them, uh, and then some I haven't heard of, like Fourth Wing, but she, so I think a pretty recent one, she was like, and he was king of the Shadow Daddies, and she was a frumpy human woman, and I was like, amazing, king of the Shadow Daddies, what an incredible description of a <laughs> man. <laughs> so, I don't know, I think that given the rate at which people on Reddit, the internet in general, YouTube, the authorship community mock this concept. I think that the care with which I want to approach it is reasonable, and I won't stand for Radosaurus trying to make me feel uncomfortable about it, is a finished thought I wanted to complete saying. Any commentary on that? Live gallery? Here, audience watching at home on Twitch, maybe you're on YouTube and you got something to say. 
I think that um, there's a difference in writing um, for a, for a, uh, the op the opposite gender in terms of writing what they think. But the the, the way you got unstuck during a game is simply just you describing a character physically and, and being careful with the the adjectives uh, that you're using to describe them, um, which is. I mean that that's that's it, it's less difficult I think than it is for writers to try and write in the mindset of the opposite gender. And I, I remember reading the um, Song of Ice and Fire books, like the Game of Thrones books, and thinking, like George R. R. Martin certainly seems to write a lot of stuff from the perspective of female characters. Like most scenes, if there's a male and a female, he'll choose to write from the female's perspective, um, which I guess is you know, his his choice as a writer. Um, but I guess as myself, having done writing as well. It's a, it's a daring choice, so to speak, to try and uh, uh, to to capture that if you're not that person. Uh, but I mean, you know, we're also gamers, so a lot of the time we explore playing characters that we're not, uh, and we're never going to get it exactly right. Um, but I, I think that to assume that it's automatically disrespectful because you're not that, I think is probably a little bit. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's a, it's a fair fair assessment. Or gamers, damn it. Sorry? That's it's a quote from the gamer series where Cass says we're gamers, damn it. Don't worry about it, James. Don't worry about it. It's me going on incredibly obscure reference tangents. Don't literally don't worry about it. Alright, I've stopped worrying. I moved on. Incredible. Lawson, do you have anything to worry about and or add to this discussion as a potential third rate co host? Um, I think it's people take too much into how people write things based on their gender. I do think that men and women do write women very similarly a lot of the times. If not the women being a little bit more than the men. I see. Well, for me, it's a problem because I have to, I constantly have to hold myself back from being like, all right, so she was kind of short like Nero from Fake Grand Order and also had large boobas like Nero from Fake Grand Order. In fact, she was basically as close to Nero from Fake Grand Order as she could be while still being copyright, trademark, and intellectually different just slightly enough that I won't get sued for this. I have a weird sense of humor sometimes, guys. Star Wars Deconstructed. That's the name of the second topic on my list here. Although I guess the first topic was technically Blast Lawson for co-hosts. And then the second was Men Writing Women by Liz Shipton. But now we've reached the third topic, Star Wars Deconstructed. There is some really cool shit in Star Wars. Star Wars has incredible moments. I think... Uh, just, I was just watching some, like, compilations of great Star Wars moments, like Ezra and Kanan, or, I guess, Doom, um, in, like, their final moments together, standing on top of what I think is some sort of fuel bunker with their, like, pie, I don't know what those things are called, like, the half TIE fighter, half gunship things that show up in Jedi Outcast. And... I don't know, anything involving Balin Skull and Ray Stevenson and Ahsoka, anything involving Anakin Skywalker and Ahsoka, like 99% of that was perfect. Almost all the original trilogy was great. Some of the stuff from Episode 7 was pretty cool. Some of the lightsaber fights from the prequel trilogies were excellent. The Acolyte, like one third of the time, was absolutely on fire with some crazy ass shit. Anytime Kimir is on screen just doing Stranger stuff, he's fucking killing it. Sometimes literally. But I think Star Wars is way too fucking complicated now. Like, I... The nature of what the Force is has changed so many times. Like, the entire basis of Star Wars... There's a living force, there's a cosmic force. Originally, there wasn't even a light side of the force. It was just the force. 
and the corruption of the dark side of the force when you try to seize the force for yourself rather than letting it guide you right like they literally in the beginning they're like let it guide you flow through you it'll send you visions it'll take you places you should obey the will of the force shit like that and then we got like star wars rebels we had this weird dude who was like i can equally wield the light side and the dark side of the force and i'm fully independent with no influence on either side of it and i'm i'm basically god and I guess at some point during Clone Wars, there's this thing... I, again, I didn't really watch Clone Wars. I did watch Bad Batch, but I didn't watch Clone Wars. Where Anakin, like, goes and meets actual Force gods. Like, the, the daddy, the daughter, and the son. And they each represent a different part of the Force. Like, good or evil or, I don't know, the living and the cosmic or some shit like that. Again, I'm getting this from, like, half a Wikipedia article that I... Again, I'm not invested in at all it's too complicated i think that if i do a future star wars show i hate to say that i'm decanonizing andor and rogue one but i think just the original three movies will be the only basis and the rule books for the ffg star wars and that's it only what's in the three movies and those three rule books will be canonically relevant which does mean I do get rid of Mara Jade, but for every Mara Jade you get rid of, you also get rid of Luke Skywalker. So, you know, you really win out in the end. I don't know. I feel like the Force is, like, too understood, too explained. And even then, even as it's, like, understood and, like, there's this thing called midi-chlorians, you can use a DBZ scouter in order to check people's power levels. like. Now lightsabers are like weird as fuck and they're like whips and shit, which was cool when I was a kid. But now I'm like, how does that work? And you can use a lightsaber as a helicopter. And I'm like, how does that work? And just just weird stuff all the time. Just weird. The philosophies are weird. Like if you look at it from like a spiritual perspective, the forces like like abstract Christian good versus evil. But it also contains a bunch of, you know, like wine notes of Eastern philosophy scattered throughout it in a way that just doesn't really come together. I think it's just confusing. And I want to, I think if I do a future Star Wars show, which I'm considering, we're going to decook. We're removing everything but the original three. Trusa Bakara doesn't happen. Ray Squadron, never heard of it. And that hurts me to say. X-Wing series, gone. X-Wing video game, also gone. Although I think the only thing that really introduces to the canon is a bunch of different medals. Now, the TIE Fighter video game, maybe we could talk. The Emperor has a dark clan of secret TIE Fighter pilots that go on hidden missions for the Empire, and it's super sick, and it gets its own fucking soundtrack. Absolutely incredible. But... All right, James. I'm looking at you. I mean, as someone who watched most of Rebels, I wasn't that keen on the whole World Between Worlds thing they did. And I also didn't like it when they then brought it into um, the Ahsoka. Ahsoka. So, like, yeah, like I, I was okay with them using those characters, obviously, because I, I like those characters. But um, yeah, I sort of feel that like, that sort of stuff was a bit far from what, a lot of us were used to with our Star Wars. Um, that it, and it was uncomfortable in seeing, I guess, in the, in the live action stuff because the live action has always been slightly divorced from the cartoons. Um, like it didn't bother me that much. It just was. It was a bit jarring at the time. Uh, and the fact that, like, you know, the final scene of Ahsoka um, with Bane and Skull also re basically effectively refers to the same content in terms of the the father, the daughter, and the son. Um, but. Uh, I mean, I take your point, and I'm as someone who's running a couple of Star Wars games right now. Um, in one of them, I have a player playing a um, escaped Dathomiri witch uh, from the um, one of the books that's got the Dathomirian witch uh, uh, sort of black books. Line. Yeah, yeah. And um, in her case, so the player's case, well, she's sort of like she represents it as you know, there's the Force and there's magic, um, and 
I think that's okay. I understand from a social perspective that's the way they look at it, but I think that you know your character would also realize that you're tapping on the same thing. You know, it's like they're you know they're they're different names of the same energy, but once again, that that's perspective. But James, um, what about the power of one? The power of two? The power of many? many. Hated that scene. Everything about it was fucking weird and uncomfortable. But look, I mean, I'm aware of the fact that you know it's it's a it is part of Star Wars now is to is to examine these things from time to time. But what if I didn't? And what if I what if like Kylo Ren, I killed off the past, but not like all the past, like the oldest stuff gets to live and everything else dies. <laughs> Well, I kill it if I have to, which is what I want to do. I have to. Like any game, that's part of the player contract. You know, it's to sort of work these things out. Now I have to convince a group of players to join me on such a journey where we, where the force is a mystery once again, and there's not the Pike Syndicate and 3,000 years of starships looking exactly the same with absolutely no changes between them, and there's one hut, and it's job of the hut, and that's it. And, uh... I don't know. It's just really complicated. The Lord be crazy, man. The Lord be crazy. Shit's gone out of control. I was watching someone that was like, no one can say they're a fan of everything Star Wars because Star Wars has got so many properties now. It's just straight out contradictory. And I was like, damn, that's, that's crazy, dude. Like visions, almost all the vision stuff is incredible. But also, some of it's just, like, absolutely wild. Like, all right, there's a dude who's going to have a lightning battle in the sky while, you know, like, falling 10,000 feet. Just fucking, I don't know, man. I don't know about that one. And then there was the the one by Studio Trigger that was like, all right, I run along the outside of a Star Destroyer. And I was like, oh, I don't know about this one either. Like, it looks cool, but I don't know that that's strictly Star Wars. And then we cut to the one that's like, the old Chinese Sith dude outside a rice village fighting the Jedi and his Padawan. I was like, damn, this is sick as fuck. This is absolutely 100% Star Wars. This is the most Star Wars anime I've ever seen. But I juxtaposed that against another one that I also felt was Star Wars. It was like the one with the weird art style that was on a dying planet. And like, it's too sisters whose mom died and joined the force and in the end they die establishing like they like destroy the pollutants on their planet and free it and they join the force alongside their mom but they're dead at the end and the planet is basically uninhabited but no longer being polluted and i was like wow what a cyclical message like i actually you know that felt like the force to me it was their mission was more important than them and by doing it, they've managed to reestablish a balance. I didn't think I would care that much about this one. I thought I at first I was like, "Damn, this one's going to be dumb." I might even skip it. I, I feel that you know, like like superhero context, Star Wars is one of those things where everybody's got their own version of Star Wars. Like what Star Wars to you might not be what Star Wars to me. Probably definitely isn't what what Star Wars to Rad. That sort of stuff. You know, everybody's different. And I agree. Like. Like with anything, you've got to work out what is going to be a part of the game you want to run. If you're going to do it via your channel, though, the, I guess there's the added complication of there's what you want to, the story you want to tell, and there's the story that the audience wants to watch. I understand. And we had a longer discussion about this earlier today, which is a great segue for uh, saying something along the lines of a long time ago. Actually, it's not that long ago, but I made a decision that. I, audience, don't take this the wrong way. I don't give a fuck what the audience wants anymore. I think it's time for me to start making the stuff that I want to make. And I think part of that comes from an original decision to just stop inviting anybody that asked to cast on my channel. I know we had a discussion that's almost certainly going to come up later about inviting more people onto this show. And I've been thinking about it the whole time because I am I am prioritizing my personal comfort in selecting cast members nowadays. 
people that I know are gonna work together without being problematic and aren't gonna fucking come at me, right? Like, I wish I could say I've lived the whole time on my channel without cast members who actually hate me or actively undermine me. But if you've been here for a few years or the whole time, it's happened at least five separate instances where people have like just outright broke channel rules. Cast members have actively worked against me or just lost their fucking minds at some point. I don't think I've ever had to shut a show down midway through, except that time on Intro Hour where I was molding. But yeah, like, I don't know. At some point, I just said, this is more important to me. Like, rather than constantly battling with people and having casts that have some friction between them, ease of use and comfort is much more important to me. So if I, I mean, that, that is part of the problem I have with shows nowadays is that I pitch shows that I want to do and people aren't interested in being on them. And that is the price I pay. So if I can't find the people for a deconstructed Star Wars show where I kill everything and go, in, you know, back to the original trilogy, either it won't happen or I'll just take those people, put them in chat GPT and have it emulate and I'll ask them what they would do and then I'll turn it into a sort of narrated series <laughs> against their will. <laughs> oh, I gotta get through it without laughing. James, your thoughts on my declaration, my mandate? Oh, Rad says that's perfect. I had you in mind, Rad, when I was thinking of that. You're the first cast member that I would have emulated by AI. <laughs> you know what? Not just James' thoughts. Lawson, thoughts as well. <laughs> no one has thoughts. I thought I heard James start to talk before you. Oh, oh okay, okay. Don't don't let me interrupt. Go ahead. Oh, I mean, I, 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 I don't have an issue with anything you've said. Okay. Um, yeah. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just obstinate in my old age. You know, once you hit about a decade of uh, YouTube, at some point you grow tired with the production of things and battling with people. And uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm entering my. Who's that guy who does the fucking thousand reshoots for everything? Um, you said somebody, but I didn't hear it. No, no. So, so who's the guy that does what? I was asking. The thousand reshoots. Uh, like, oh my god. No. <laughs> I meant thousand reshoots to get it right, not the incompetent one. Um, <laughs> you gotta be more specific. I'm I'm cooking my brain. I, God damn it. He's in the epic rap battles one for uh, Steven Spielberg, so hold on. I'll just go look it up. Alfred Hitchcock? Is he the one that does the thousand reshoots? I don't think that's right, though, but I'm gonna... He's definitely the one that puts himself in every movie. He's yeah, in. yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, technically, I'm in all of my own series as well. Like my wife, who was born... He's, he's the same, same birthday as my wife, and they were both born on um, Friday the 13th. Here we go. Hold on. I got to it. Stanley Kubrick. Oh, Kubrick, okay. Yes. It's Crocs one born on Friday the 13th and has the same birthday as my wife. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. But Stanley Kubrick's the one that continuously reshoots the movie until he gets it the way he wants it to be. Right? And I feel like I might be entering that phase. That's where I'm at now, where it's more important for me to have it be better than good than it is to just get it out there. I don't know. I have an eye for increasing quality in production nowadays. Which is at odds with my natural laziness. Well, impartial good news to spread around. Cottontailed is working on a new set of generic overlays for me. And less importantly, a new set of Twitch panels. So like when you scroll down on my Twitch page, the headers. That sort of stuff. So we can... Sorry? They'll be nice to see, I'm sure. Sure, sure. I mean, I don't really change them that often, but it feels like it's time to swap them away from what 
I currently have and move it to a sort of more traditional fantasy-ish sort of deal and away from the sort of metallic way that I've got. I mean, it's not the first time I've swapped between them before. That's just how tabletop RPGs are. All right, so I, I have a topic here called the Blue Sky Meeting. And I'm not sure when I want to do it. I was thinking in two weeks, but I'm not, I'm not super set on that. So I think it might, might be closer to three weeks where intro hour on the 25th will be converted into the blue sky meeting. What that's going to be is an opportunity for current and former cast members to pitch me on future shows or concepts, anything at all. I will be available for it. I'm probably going to put out a, and this is why we're not going to do it in two weeks because I didn't get it done in time, a like Google form to just submit your thoughts if you can't come personally. But I want to give people plenty of time to like think about it and like pitch and, and get whatever you need to out there. Can't tell you it'll be available immediately. Probably won't even start thinking about it for about six months. But Maybe someone will have some genius idea about a show I've already pitched, or maybe they'll have something completely new that really interests me, and more importantly, interests other cast members in the audience. So, and if nobody shows up, I'll just cancel a your hour that night. So that is what it is. So let's, I'm going to pencil it in here for the 25th. That's in America times for all our non-Americans, which there's more non-Americans nowadays than I thought. Which is a good segue, James, into the survey data. If you, you know, if you have anything you want to say before I do the breakdown of your breakdown, a sort of summary of a summary. Uh, I mean, now, what I will say is that um, I have surveyed gamers before um, for different topics, mainly around conventions. And, you know, the... the, the a lot of the base data that I was used to seeing there was consistent with what I saw in the responses to AP's survey, um, just in terms of individual preferences, um, demographics. You know, overall, I think that, you know, it's pretty consistent. And I gave AP some thoughts on what I think, you know, he could use to either expand his depth, as in, you know, go deeper with the current audience in terms of doing more, more of what they want, to get more engagement from them, uh, or alternatively doing more in terms of uh, breadth to try and bring in a, a wider or more diverse audience that might, you know, also by, by token enhance the overall community by having new people, new thoughts, new ideas. Excellent. Audience, I'm about to vomit information at you that as James was talking, I was writing down. It is not in a presentable format. So it will will just be vomit at you. Just know, James had an incredible hour-long presentation, and I'm going to break it into five minutes. So 90% of respondents are male identifying, which I thought was very interesting, which meant that the survey was not emblematic of uh, my greater channel analysis since... <laughs> I'm adjusting my glasses, but I'm now recognizing that my VTuber icon doesn't do it. Channel analysis currently shows a 99.9% .9 male preference on YouTube. Bulk age range is age 30 to 39. Sadly, I have no viewers from Antarctica. That is a market I was really hoping to break into, given the fact that they, you know, are stuck together for about six months. I feel like if I could get it, break into that market, you know, you really have um, permanency there. Oceania featured highly, according to James, much more than he uh, anticipated. And many of the non-North American respondents, I think he said all non-North American respondents, are English as a second language. All, all non-North American and Oceanic. Ah, I see, I see. English second language. What, he's including Australia and Oceanic, so I assume. That yeah. would be correct. The super majority of survey respondents have watched between 2 and 10 years. 
Retention, viewer retention doesn't seem to be an issue, although the survey would never show that because if you weren't watching, you wouldn't do the survey. Only one respondent had started watching in the last year, which was deeply hurtful to me, but that's how life goes. The majority of people watch two hours a week or one show per week per month. Battletech is still the most popular thing on the channel. I wrote, I wrote a note here that says Grimdark James broke down my foolishness. What was that in response to? Oh, okay, I got it. That was when I was like, huh, according to this data, it looks like Warhammer 40k and Pyramid Maledictum is more popular than Battletech. And then you pointed a finger at me from across the courtroom and you said, objection. And you pointed out how because there are viewers who only watch Oath of Endosteel or only watch Blades of Honor, that I wasn't actually including the number of people who solely watch Battletech. And that due to the overlap between those two and the unique viewers between those two, more people watch Battletech specific content than Imperium Maledictum. At that point, the judge awarded you the case and I went to ghost prison. Yeah. yeah, I just I let that sit there for a minute. I'm pretty sure there's at least one uh, Phoenix Wright game where that happens. So, Majority of people watch two shows a month. High engagement viewers. The customer period. James will not explain this to me. Two question marks. Uh, okay, so I explained the customer period. <laughs> okay, it's just, listen, I was just... Just make extreme of consciousness notes, okay? You don't have to explain complex corporate structure to me. Low engagement viewers. What is presenting, preventing you from watching more? Super majority of answers, no time. Half of respondents to the survey are current or former cast members. Attrition to other shows, not a problem. Things that matter to survey respondents the most? The setting, the cast, and the regularity of videos. Now, I do want to stop right here and, and talk about regularity of videos. Based on this answer, I and how important it was ranked, not just how many people said it was important, but the importance they placed on that, I am considering continuing to remove live shows and making almost everything into a YouTube series-like release where we let a bunch of episodes get stacked up and then putting the non-live content on Twitch or whatever Twitch's contractual agreement with me is. I have to give them 24 hours, I think. I, I believe you can upload episodes or videos and then set them to stream, and then I'll just sit there and watch the live chat and make sure nobody misbehaves. And uh, then it'll go on YouTube, Patreon will get to see it before either of those two, and then we'll have, I don't know, like 10 or 12 episodes cooked and ready to go and drop them all at once. My test case for this will be Solaris Nights with a K. And we'll see how people do with that. We'll get some data on it and the whole channel may shift in that direction i did not realize how much the regularity of videos i.e that they appear in your your feed every week matter to people but i'm actually a fan of uh little wars tv youtube channel and when they don't release videos regularly it does get a bit concerning so i think that, i think that you um might have misinterpreted some data there oh Please, the, the, data interpretation guy, please uninterpret my data. The, so out, out of the seven aspects of what you look for in a show, regularity rated the third lowest. So I thought it was the, the highest. Third. No, no. I thought it was the, setting, cast, and regularity. No, setting system and cast. Oh. Yeah, so so from, from highest to lowest, it was setting, cast, system. Uh, that's why regularity is the middle. So regularity... Then uh, channel length and lifetime. So regularity was in the middle. Sorry, it was right. And the time it displays on for people who watch the live shows was rated the lowest of all. Lowest. Yeah, like, I like, still what, feel like, pretty people justified. People yeah, people don't choose to watch a show based upon what time it, it's going to be shown live. 
Yeah, I am curious. I think I, I'm still going to go ahead and do it this way for Solaris Nights with K and see how I feel about it. And maybe I'll care about how the audience feels about it. Uh, I will say this, Solaris Nights with a K, taking up a lot of hard drive space. <laughs> a lot of hard drive space. But maybe it'll work out. 82% of survey respondents wanted a full gameplay session plus cast interactions at the beginning and the end. This probably will not change in regards to beginnings. I know, and James even wrote me up some pre-game ideas for length and breadth or, or whatever. Well, it wasn't length and breadth. It was depth and breadth, but the intro hour was literally born out of the idea that if I let people rant and rave, especially me, but also other people, they will fuck around. The show will take forever to get started and half the people are going to skip it. And the important part is that YouTube data shows that people literally don't give a fuck about intros most of the time. As, as a result of the way that the YouTube algorithm works and now prioritizes watch time over, um, over views, people not watching the full length of the video by skipping past hurts your video quite badly. So it's not just a thing for me where I'm like, okay, it takes forever to steer people back towards getting the show started, and it's kind of a loss of control in production. It's also a problem that YouTube literally is like, hey, go fuck yourself on this note. So I, I, I mean, this show was made for you, Radosaurus. The intro hour was made for you. <laughs> And one of the survey ideas was to just have a second intro hour that's just you and me, Rad, where we do the Radosaurus hour and we just talk about you. So, I don't know if that was your own submission. <laughs> but we'll, we'll talk more about James's other, other ideas about pre- and post-gameplay. There is a possibility, based on one of the ways he wanted to present Free game chats, like cast discussion, that it it could still make it into a deliverable format. But I don't know. How do I say this? I don't want to say it's like sacred time, but for me, to some extent, it's not just like a brief moment of calm and quiet where I'm just letting everybody like sit and like talk to each other, like. It's a moment for the cast to just kind of get together and talk. And I don't know, like, it's private. You know what I mean? Like, it's not for the audience. I don't know what we do before the show starts. And I get it. I know the ways intros used to work. I just didn't like them. And I don't like how I get when I have an unlimited amount of time to rant about Disney shows. It's a problem. It's a real problem. Popular content, according to James's surveys, that I'll almost certainly be doing in the future. Session and campaign planning and game mastering tips featured quite prominently, and I think I could deliver on these. Maybe. I don't know I could deliver quality, but I can deliver on it. I think before the survey idea was even cooking, I was thinking of doing one of these for Imperium Maledictum that basically promised that the next, ep not, not the immediate next episode, but the one after this one will be a campaign prep episode. The cast and I will be doing downtime for a week, and I will probably live cook up uh, on stream, on Twitch, recorded, going to YouTube, a guideline for how to do the inter season one to two imperium maledictum the dark holds uh set up i might i'm probably not going to do like the making of the map and all the combat encounters i'll do that maybe in a completely different video but setting up how to do season one to two planning out season two's like meta arc planning out season three's meta arc the names of the seasons, what I think is going to be important to cast members, how I keep them on the hook and employed with the rogue trader while also moving their characters up in the organization. 
and anticipating their future long-term goals. I mean, with that, it's really a crapshoot. Like, I have less than a 50% chance of guessing that. And with someone like James, probably way less than someone like Kane. Like, Kane's goals are tend to be very straightforward, and he's clear where he wants his character to go. I feel like I can guess that pretty easily. With James, literally anything could happen. He could turn the church against me. So my guesses there will probably be somewhat less accurate. We'll talk about it in the episode, and we'll see how we aim such a thing. I feel like I'm giving away the whole cow before we even get into it. But game mastering tips, I don't know that <laughs> I'm thinking about it. My working title is called The Unfinished Thought which is completely related to the fact that I never finish my thoughts half the time. But a game mastering series, the thing is my style has changed so much over the years, and what is and isn't, I don't want to say meta or even appropriate. I don't really know how to term it, but the way that people run games has changed drastically, especially because of 5e, but before that, Pathfinder changed the way people looked at stuff after Pathfinder. I think the explosion of Apocalypse World binding the Game Master by specific rules has sort of exploded out into like Blades in the Dark, I think is probably the most prominent one where Game Masters are bound by specific move sets. And um, what's the critical role version of Blades in the Dark? That's Candle Obscura. Ah, Candela Obscura. I was going to say Daggerheart, but yes, it is Candela Obscura. I mean, that that audience has never been introduced to the idea of GMs not having unlimited power. And the idea... I don't know. I think rules for Game Masters help focus them and focus the campaign to some extent. Unlimited power poor game masters and like no structure can work and it can also be problematic i think it's personality based for people which brings me back to game mastering tips the way that i run games and the way that people feel is appropriate to run games changes pretty often and there are a lot of game mastering tips out there i feel like i could do a very short series and i guess i will but it'll be with a huge number of caveats at the beginning and probably i'll do a future series that's like a reaction video that's like hey remember when i said this i was totally wrong here's a thumbnail of me doing the wojack face while pointing back at my other self being like what the hell is this guy talking about the most popular game systems that the people want according to the survey are established but not mainstream games like star wars world of darkness call of cthulhu number two is independent rpg published like mothership and number three is mainstream D, &D pathfinder so that gives me a pretty clear consensus to start looking into a world of darkness and star wars game and I have some more thoughts about a Call of Cthulhu light game that if we have time tonight, I will present. Modern was extremely low in terms of genres that people care about. Superhero is also dunked. It's, it's out, which is really unfortunate because I just reread um, Brandon Sanderson's Reckoners trilogy and I was like, damn, we could set a really fucking cool superhero game in this setting where all the superheroes are like inherently evil like an evil voice in their head acts as their consciousness and tells them to be annoyed at anyone who is lesser than them which is anyone who doesn't have godlike power and then you play human resistance members attempting to turn superheroes to the light in a sort of injustice way or kill them assassinate them I think that could be a great tabletop RPG campaign, but pretty much anything Sanderson writes is a good tabletop RPG campaign because he writes them like they're a tabletop RPG campaign. At the top of the list, again, presenting a mandate, science fiction, fantasy, and science fantasy, which is way less than fiction or fantasy. 
science fantasy, which is very strange because for me, science fantasy just means Star Wars, but. And people are upset that I don't show the dice rolls, which, you know, they always will be. It's a hassle. It's a hassle to do it. I did it for Pendragon and literally no one cares. But if you don't do it, everyone gets upset. And if you do show them, no one cares. It's really the people who do and don't care are extremely vocal about it. Game systems that need to make a comeback or are popular. Battletech at the highest. No surprise to anyone. Star Wars. World of Darkness. Shadowrun and Cyberpunk tied neck and neck. And James had more to say about... More to say, have you, Master? <laughs> that... I, I just... I just said, yeah, that if you if you consider Shadowrun and Cyberpunk as a combined genre and add together unique responses there, it actually rated higher than Star Wars, but still just one under Battletech. Yes, but I wanted to make a Yoda reference. And then I lost myself in it. Shows that people would like to see return. Dirk and Ludger and someone. And Burning Wheel, which I thought was really interesting. And based on a Blades of Honor discussion that we had at the season one finale last night, I I think I could sell James on Burning Wheel. I don't think I could sell Radosaurus on Burning Wheel, even though I think that it aligns with some of the mechanics that he wants. I think it would be so complicated that he would not like it. And I don't know. It's a real toss-up whether I could get Neo Buzzard into Burning Wheel, but since I can only lock one person in there, I don't think I can pitch it for a replacement dice system for Stars Without Numbers in our Blades of Honor game. But I think I would like another Burning Wheel game. It, just to be very clear, the people who like Burning Wheel like it a lot. Us Burning Wheel players, though, understand that the way the rules work is that if you're like, I'm going to hit somebody with my sword, you open yourself up to also being hit with a sword, and any sort of violence almost certainly will end poorly for everyone involved. Like, it's a system that violence, unless you're very good at it, unless you're like a trained soldier, you'll die as a result of violence. Um, I almost feel like Burning Empires could have worked well with... I do. I, I, I also have been... Well, I was thinking Burning Empires for... Um, Blades. Blades, yeah, Blades of Honor. Because it means I don't have to convert from a low fantasy setting to a sci-fi because they've already done it for me to to some extent. But the thing about Burning Wheel and, and Burning Empires, which is the sci-fi Burning Wheel, and some of the others, I think someone did like a Greek conversion. Wise Fool told me that there's like a uh, Romance of the Three Kingdoms China version. The key part about Burning Wheel is that it has a Skyrim-ish style level up system for your, your skills, attributes, and all that stuff. In order to level them up, you have to use them. But more than just use them, you have to succeed and fail at them a certain number of times. You need to learn lessons from success and failure. If you keep only doing things that are way too easy for you and you only ever succeed, you'll never get better. And if you never succeed, you also will never get better. You need a mix of both. But and you've got to do it at like like points of conflict too, like not just you can yeah. Skyrim run down the road jumping constantly to level up your athletics. That could because the game master decides when you roll. So yeah. you can't just like roll you can't be Dave Walters. You can't just roll dice whenever you feel like it and then say out loud what the dice roll was after you see the result. <laughs> I really like B. Dave Walters, but when he does that shit on paid streams, it drives me insane. Pretty much, he's, he's doing um, D and D in a castle now. Yes, 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 yes. The other thing about Burning Wheel that I think lends itself very well, we'll just set aside that its debate system is pretty much legendary, um, and and one of the best ways for interpersonal social conflicts. The way that you gain certain types of experience beyond just using skills is you set goals for your characters that are more like thoughts or mission statements. And as you complete them, there's a question of, do you lean into it 
and actually follow through with that thought? Or do you choose to rebuke it and go in the exact opposite direction? Have you, have you thought of a new way? Is this not working for you? And if you do that, you are in a different type of currency, a different type of like experience token that you'll spend. And as you earn, it's like deeds and uh, fate and other stuff. As you spend those to help you re-roll or automatically succeed on rolls and stuff like that, you'll slowly qualify your skills to do what's called gray shading and white shading, which is where rather than needing a five or a, rather than needing like a six to succeed or a five or a six, it'll end up being like a four and a six or a three and a six as you gray and white shade. I, I don't remember the exact thing. It has been like five years since I played Burning Wheel and I haven't kept up on the rules, but as you continue to enlightenly shade your dice, what amount you need to succeed will get lower. And so by, by the time you've shaded a dice, you're probably going to be pretty skilled at it, throwing three, four, five, or six dice. And needing one lower on a D6 is going to give you a lot of leeway. You're going to be successful a lot more. It represents you becoming extremely skilled or even supernaturally or godlike. And I, when they say godlike, they actually mean like, like a deity at doing something. Like having white shaded magic is basically akin to being a sort of sorcerer king god. I have a note here that just says World of Darkness. James probably told me. Oh, he says, James's conclusion, invest in Shadowrun, Star Wars, World of Darkness. I think probably your World of Darkness comment was the fact that I gave you a pivot of just non-male identifying respondents, and the only one that got multiple votes was World of Darkness. Oh, yeah, what really pithy thing did I say? Oh, yes, yes, it was something like, if I want to reach the gaze, I should do World of Darkness and Vampire. So I'm probably going to do a vampire, and it's probably going to be controversial because I'm going to do 5th edition because I like that Black Lodge Games uh, article on running World of Darkness slash Vampire as a Mafia game during the current modern era of the rules. Not necessarily the rule set is important to me. The setting is what's important. The fact that humans have discovered vampires exist and in modern governments are now hunting them down with drone strikes and SWAT teams, and the Vatican is tracking them as well. And that in between all of that, everyone around you that's a vampire is constantly going insane and losing control. Black Lodge Games has an excellent, I mean, I've posted it several times, about Vampire the Masquerade is really a game about the Italian mob. I like that interpretation so much that that's pretty much the only way I will play. Well, that's the only way I'll run it, is things are bad, and they're only going to get worse, and vampire kind is coming to an end. Maybe it won't be today or tomorrow, it could be in a century or a millennia, but humans are winning, the scales have tipped. And now, it's about survival. Of you, of your coterie, of your clan, of the species, because the humans are dangerous, and they're learning. Anyway. Rad says he likes that. He likes that. He just wants to play the Sopranos. <laughs> Somebody bring me the Capicola. It's so funny. Capicola sounds very different than how it, how it is written. James has some notes here about depth and breadth. I don't know if you actually want to just introduce that part, James. Because I made a bunch of notes that I probably don't want to reveal yet, but you had good just, suggestions. Yeah, just that I, I was saying that, um, uh, so that based on the survey data, the way that I interpreted it in a data analytic way was that there were two potential paths forward. One was to increase the depth, as, as in, I think I mentioned this before, about going harder with the current audience, and the other one was about the new audience. I thought that for the group that, um, for the current audience, the best thing would be either a uh, Star Wars or 
Shadow Runs the Cyberpunk game uh, pretty much run the way that things are currently run, so two to three hours potentially with um, recorded intro slash outro, you know, or either sent as part of the show or sent to Patreons. Um, it'll be it'll be direct to Patreon. Yeah, because I think six people um, in the survey or five people in the survey asked for AP as a player more. Uh, and then the other one, the the breadth, so the depth, no, the breadth, breadth one was about uh, potentially looking at yeah, World of Darkness, a very political intrigue game, different to what's currently on the channel, potentially with a, an associated planning. And um, I, I guess because you know when you've got a when you've got a, a show with factions and uh, stuff happening in the background, it might help to have like a GM episode from time to time where the GM explains to the audience what's happening outside of the player's perspective uh, and in order to sort of give the world more life. Uh, and that potentially could be run in a different format, which was pre-recording a longer show, but then releasing it into um, shorter segments. So rather than having to say to a cast, hey, I need four or five people to be available one hour for three hours every week on this day, Simply say, okay, you guys, I need to find a day this month or in these four weeks where we can all play for four hours straight and record that, and then I'll release it every fortnight as two-hour episodes. Uh, and that might be a way to um, potentially bring in new players too because it means you're less constrained by who's available what days. Um, and it means that if, if the show doesn't work, it's less, less time invested. So for the folks at home, when he says Fortnite, it's because James and I play Fortnite every two weeks. He doesn't mean every 14 days. James, I cut you off doing my stupid bit. Please, please redo your finishing thought. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think that I've, I've covered it off there. I, I, anything okay. else I really say? The other thing you suggested is that I start putting out expressions of interest where I ask people what shows they would like to be a part of or if they'd like to be a part of show at all. And then it's sort of like an application I can sort through rather than recruiting directly for specific shows. And and also probably not um, like not spending too much time trying to find other produce other people to collab with, like, like, you know, focus on the on the audience you have rather than you know, constantly reaching out to other YouTubers like VTubers who are just sounds like rebuffing you because they're constantly. Yeah. Yeah. For six or seven years straight. Yeah. Brutal. It's crushing. Lawson, any thoughts on the last 12, 14 minutes of my jibber jabber and then James's amazing explanations. Um, I do think it's nice to hear certain names pop up that haven't been part of the regular cycle of games recently. Uh, some of them may have been on my response sheet, which might be why I'm happy to hear them. But I think uh, a lot of good points are made. I don't know that we have enough time to do this presentation, so I'm going to do Nemesis real quick. Rather than do Call of Cthulhu, I was thinking of doing a different uh, Silent Legions which is Kevin Crawford starts without numbers, uh, you know, without numbers system, but as Call of Cthulhu. Just because Call of Cthulhu is kind of a real pain in the ass. But whether I do Call of Cthulhu or whether I do Silent Legions or whether I do something Call of Cthulhu adjacent, what's most important to me is that we use a phasmophobia style clues system since mysteries are so important to people. I think that if we had Maybe let's, I don't want to capstone it, but let's say hypothetically there were five gods that were interrelated in a sort of eldritch, great older one, ancient pantheon sort of deal. And many of them shared one to two types of clues with each other. Therefore, if you could get together the three clues in the same way that three clues in Phasmophobia, a game about hunting ghosts will allow you to determine which ghost you're specifically dealing with and therefore rebut it, you would get the three clues necessary in order to rebut a specific elder god and stop their plane upon the world. And so that would be the way that I would want to structure it, which isn't technically the way a Call of Cthulhu works, which is why I'm looking more at Silent Legions, although I'm aware that basically no one's ever heard or played Silent Legions. So the structure of it is more important to me than the system with which we do it, because it's more about people going slowly insane, as I described, really horrible stuff, and the method of solving the problem. 
finding a specific new god. We have 10 seconds left. The two of you can do your outros. I'm James. I'm Lawson. Meowth. That's right. Oh, shit. I should have saved that. Okay, now.